You're watching the Letterman Podcast with Mike Chisholm, endorsed by the Hello Deli. Yeah! <laughs> Once again, welcome to the Letterman Podcast. My name is Mike Chisholm. If you are watching this uh, broadcast, you may notice that I'm wearing the same outfit that I was wearing when I did the intro to Joe Grossman Part 1. Well, that's because I'm doing it on the same day. It's the magic of video editing uh, at its most basic level. Um, yes, I am very excited again to a uh, broken record talk about Joe Grossman. When we last left him, it was revealed that he is working for The Tonight Show. We're going to start right there talking about that. We're going to move into uh, how he started with Late Show and uh, all sorts of other stuff. We're going to talk about Samantha B a little bit because when he left Late Show, he went to Samantha B. Um, I believe he did the entire run there as well. That's uh, Full Frontal with Samantha B. So phenomenal work there. Uh, now working for The Tonight Show. But we are going to finish with a conversation that I uh, am delighted by. If you were to make me pick my very favorite if you if I if you put a gun to my head, um, and and well hell even if you didn't because this is what nerds do nerds like to talk about oh well you know what's my favorite moment of this or what, uh what's my favorite what if moment in this franchise that kind of a thing, um you know what if Batman fought Superman and we found out on screen or at least sort of did uh, a few years ago what would happen if if you had to if you if you gave me the um opportunity to pick one era of the entire David Letterman run um, that I would have to say is my favorite. And I'd kind of plant my flag and say it's my very favorite era. It would probably be when Late Shift 2 happened. Uh, when Conan, uh, Conan O'Brien, um, you know, was given The Tonight Show and then ousted from The Tonight Show and all the things, The Jay Leno Show, all of that stuff. Um, and Dave's reaction to it nightly. I, uh, I, Dave one time called it the golden age of television. Um, Joe was Joe was a big part of that. He was a writer for the show at that point, uh, and and he had actually a, a moment on there during that 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 made me howl and still does to this day. Uh, being able to talk to him about that was really cool because he and I both have an admiration for 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 David Letterman and for Conan O'Brien and have since we were since he and I were both kids. Again, we're both around the same age, which is one of the reasons why. I just appreciate him so much. And um, anyway, so that's near the end of the episode of part two here. Uh, why am I talking about it? Well, I like the sound of my own voice. No, I don't really. Uh, actually, I really don't like the sound of my own voice, but I do really like the fact that I've had this conversation with him and that we could do that again down the line. Um, I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I clearly enjoyed um, partaking in it. Uh, so without further ado, here is the Letterman podcast, Joe Grossman, part two. Magic is clearly gone, but yeah. you, you still know that there are some really special ghosts wandering these halls somewhere. So that's here's exciting. a question for you back then uh, in the offices of Conan or now in the offices where Seth is, have you ever seen the pickle? No, no, no. I, I, I've never really been in the offices of, well, I was never in the offices for Conan, not beyond like the reception area to drop off some mail or something. Um, but I, I, I mostly just, in terms of my work for, with the Conan show, I can't even say I worked for Conan. No, I, no, I, I understand. I, I would I'm seat audiences and line people up, times in 30 rock. but I wouldn't go into the offices or anything. Like I, that, that wasn't really my place, but I, I would, you know, lead tours into the studio and I'd do my own little spiel and I'd, slip in a few, you know, you know, by the way, Letterman used to be here too. And that was a really good show. And I'd probably talk almost as much about Dave as I would about Conan in there. Um, but yeah, yep. so, so I, so I did that. And the, the only time I was in the offices for, uh, for, for Seth Meyers, uh, I, I did interview there for a job uh, oh. about seven years, I guess, after Letterman ended, I, I, yep. I was lucky enough to, you know, I wrote a packet and I got the interview, but, mm, and I, I had a, a meeting with Seth and a few other people there and, and they were very nice and very friendly. And, 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 and he seems like one of the, the, the nicest, most well-adjusted and hosts out there. Um, but unfortunately, uh, <laughs> maybe that's why they didn't hire me. <laughs> uh, they're, they're a little too well-adjusted to have me there. Um, but yeah, I did not see the pickle. Uh, okay. Under well, there's somebody who did get the job back then. I don't know when they started working, but they worked for you guys and now they work for, for, for Seth. And I've asked them, can you please send me a picture of the current pickle if it exists or not? Um, I don't know if that's going to happen or not. But anyway, now that you're in 30 Rock all the time, I wish you luck if you if ever yeah. that's something that you want to see. I hope you go see it. Sure. Seth must have really enjoyed you, though, because, I mean, you talk about a writer 
like mm-hmm. that must have been a delightful meeting a couple of writers kind of throwing things around together uh he was I mean, no he was very friendly I, I think i was just you know they, i'm sure they interview a lot of writers and honestly none of them really... <laughs> We're a certain kind of breed. <laughs> I was going to ask you about that because Steve Young talks about it, and he says that 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 we're bent, and 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 you know the most that we can say is oh that's funny you know we're broken comedy writer the broken comedy writer mentality, um, but you're his junior just like I am, and I see you not just deadpan that's funny. It doesn't seem like you're quite yeah. there yet, <laughs> and I don't know if it's a progression or not, but it doesn't seem like you're a broken comedy writer. Uh, no, 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 I, 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 I showed up broken. I assure you. Um, I, I, uh, uh, no, I, I, I can, we're all on a spectrum, uh, pardon the pun, but we are no, on a spectrum, I, not necessarily the spectrum, but, but no, there's, there's a little right. bit of both to be honest. Yeah. And, uh, there's a spectrum of, of social skills. You'll, you'll meet a lot of comedy writers who are very awkward and quiet or creepy or whatever. And I'm sort of toward that end but not the worst but there are also plenty of comedy writers who are very outgoing and congenial and, and and affable like you know my my wife always says about lee lee ellenberg who was one of the writers with me at letterman oh he's he's the most normal writer i've ever met like she, she's met most of the people i've worked with she said oh lee is so nice i like him because he's normal you know <laughs> and you know god bless me and all these people we're, we're very nice people but we're we're <laughs> a little tricky to well i, I would throw i would throw the idea of quirky out there i can yeah. um i can certainly relate i'm not a comedy writer but i do very much enjoy writing um and 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 if i can throw clever in there and every once in a while i i, I actually connect with the ball and, and there is clever there um there's quirks that come with that personality that i've always been able to kind of identify with people like that so i'm just gonna ask you this have you ever collected things do you collect things no, not really. No, I, I, okay. I don't. I don't have the room for it. I don't have the space for it. Collecting things is one of the ones that uh, O'Donnell has talked about with me and, and, and a few others um, that sometimes comedy writers do. But usually, there's a quirker there, a quirky hobby, a quirky interest, oh, yeah. uh, things like that. Is that you? Do you have any quirks like that? No, I'm 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 the most normal person you'll ever meet in the world. <laughs> um, I, I, no, I, I just I don't have any collecting things. But no, um, I, I I have my own my own. <laughs> I don't even know what they're. You'd probably have to talk to my wife about that. Um, okay. Uh, and and what does yeah. your wife do, by the way? Uh, she's actually a, a sort of an environmental sustainability expert. Um, so she works on, like, she knows things. She's a smart person. She uh, went to I got Yale one of my and life stuff, too. and it's like, oh my god. <laughs> yep. Uh, I feel so worthless. Um, I've but, got one know, of those in my life too. I, I I can. You're preaching to the choir, my friend. Right. Uh, and then I leveled I, up when I when I got that one. I was. And, uh, and, yeah. 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 Well, no, no. And, and yeah, there, there are a lot. Of us. So, you know, and, and, and you know, I, I go on TV and drink urine. So, you know, that, that's fun. <laughs> which is environmentally responsible. It is. You know, <laughs> oh, my God. I'm sorry if I stepped on that in any way, shape or form. Holy cow. That's fantastic. You oh, had you a beautiful anything, beginning, no. middle and end on that one. That's I fantastic. Did, that, was, that was not a planned thing. That was not me trying <laughs> to get anywhere. It's just me rambling and trying not to uh, let too many silences take over. Uh, um, and sorry, how many kids? Uh, two kids, two little and girls. Yeah. What are the ages? Uh, they're nine and four. Oh, I got a four-year-old yeah. granddaughter, and she's my favorite thing in the whole world. She's yeah, my it, favorite thing. Oh my it, gosh, it's a very, very fun age, and 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 yeah, yeah. And she has no idea what I do for a living, and I'm so happy for her. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. I think we got off on a tangent before, and you were asking me about uh, about the, the the path to Letterman from from college and such. Perfect. Uh, I don't know if you want to ask me something please. else and go back to that. No, um, please. So the the other thing when I moved to New York in '98. Uh, my backup plan, well, not my backup, but I, I sort of a two tier thing was, okay, first I'll try this page thing. But also I found out that um, I'd done a little bit of research and called some places. Like I found out that that shows all these late night shows, uh, none of them would accept any kind of outside submissions from any amateur writers unless they came through an agent with the exception for some reason of Letterman. <laughs> the biggest show, as far as I'm concerned, yeah. was the one that was willing to read material from literally anyone, as long as you first got a release form and fill that out saying, and if I see something like my idea on your show, I promise not to sue you basically. Okay. So I requested that form when I moved here in 98 and now are these packets or is this like a faxer type thing? Well, I wasn't really sure at the time. Okay. It turned out to be uh, it's three form and then it came with an assignment. Oh, interesting. Okay. An assignment, right. uh, Basically here are three top 10 list topics, fill out the jokes for these topics. And then also, you know, write two or three pages of miscellaneous ideas that you think might be good for the show. So I got this in uh, November 98, I remember, is when I finally received this packet. 
and it was just terrifying. It's like you have oh, your whole yeah. future in your hands. Yeah. Like, what, what do I do with this now? So I remember giving It's like myself, you're playing Plinko on The Price is Right. It's like, oh, gulp. Okay, yeah, I guess I got to... Don't screw this up. Yeah. And, and <laughs> so I got this packet and like, okay, I guess I got to do this now. This is real. So I gave myself a one month deadline uh, at the end of November of, of 1998. Yeah. It was basically three or four weeks and to, to send it back. And that packet sat in my desk drawer for four years <laughs> because I was too afraid to send it in. I, I wrote the top 10 lists and I spent way too much time on those. And I wrote a few other ideas and I looked at it and I thought, this isn't good enough. This is, uh, if I have one shot, I don't want to screw this up. So let's just not even try, at least not try oh, yet. Oh, you're breaking my heart. That's so, crazy. So that thing haunted me like the, the telltale heart just oh beating my in my God. desk drawer for four years. Um, <laughs> but in that time, while the packet was sitting there, I, I you know, I, I did the NBC page thing. Yep. Uh, then I got the job at the magazine and I, I started off as a, a, a copy editor, which is basically like a proofreader, you know, spelling and punctuation and usage yep. and all that grammar. And then I, I, I got a few chances to start writing and then writing more. They liked my work at the magazine so I could write articles and then I became an editor. And what I found was, oh, I've sort of developed a little bit of confidence in writing for public consumption. Yeah. I've gotten some positive feedback from my work. And after a year or two of doing that, I thought, okay, I think I can muster the courage to revisit this packet. So I filled yeah. it out. And uh, did you change very much of it? Yeah. Okay. I, I, you know, I kept like half the jokes. I looked back at some of them and thought, you know, I don't know if I can do better than that. It's not great, but I'm not going to beat it. But yeah, probably about half the jokes I, re I, I changed. And I, I added some new other ideas that I don't, I don't even remember one of my, any of my miscellaneous ideas. Of that. Thankfully, I'm sure they were terrible. Hmm. Um, but I, I mailed in the, the, the packet and, 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 Amazingly, within a month, I got a call from uh, Bob Borden. Do you remember Bob? Oh my gosh! He was the writer's assistant at the time, but he was yeah. also an on-camera guy. He did a lot of remotes and stuff. Yeah. Saying, "Hey, uh, the head writers, the Stangle, Eric and Justin Stangle at the time, uh, saw your packet. They liked it. Um, could you write us another packet?" And I said, uh -huh, "Sure, okay, <laughs> okay, yeah, another one, okay, yeah, okay, great." Are you watching the show? You know, semi regularly or regularly at this? Yeah, point? yeah, of course. At the, yep. at the, at the, yeah, you stayed um, with it. You know, I I I dropped out of watching a little bit in the mid '90s, a little bit yeah. partially because I was in college and I was just barely trying to have a social life at night. <laughs> um, but also, um, again, I, I love Dave. I love the show, but but the show had gotten so big in those yeah. first CBS years that it, it it lost some of the appeal to me of the, the 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 quiet weirdness. I know they there was a reason for that bigness. They kind of had to do that to justify CBS 1130. It's the 1135 show. It's Dave's so, Tonight Show is what, absolutely. What, what was presented. And it had and to that, be changed. That yeah. bigness is what made the show very successful at that time. And it was what needed to be done. But as a viewer, I didn't connect with it as much. So I, I, I faded in and out for the next few years. But by this can time- I throw a, Can I throw a music analogy there? Because we've talked about this a lot on the show here. And, and I mean, I've been thinking about this and meditating on that a little bit. Uh, again, which shows you how uh, much of a life I have. But um, the idea, it's almost like your favorite indie rock band yes. suddenly going big. You that know, exactly like, oh, right. I loved Green Day when Kerplunk right. came out, but after Dookie, everything sucked, you know, like, and I think that, um, and which I don't feel, by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm able to love the Chili Peppers now and from back then, but but it's kind of like that where some people are like, the, they love the indie scene, the whole almost a you sold out type 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 mentality yeah. and 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 oh i liked this when just me and my little friends liked it now that everyone likes it right and, and there's a lot of that within the letterman community uh, i even see that to this day I, i'll see people who, who who gravitate to one or the other but there's a lot of people also who gravitate towards late show so yeah. but you're okay so am i yeah that is with that that's yes that is the perfect analogy it's okay. like you know yeah, I loved REM in the first few years, but you know, I mean, Stand is that really the best? Thing? You know, is, is that, <laughs> yeah. of course, there's Chris Elliott uh, uh, connection notwithstanding. Forget a life, but uh, um, but yeah, it's like it it it, it does have some of that. Uh, you know, I I never thought, oh, Dave's a sellout, but it was just it, it's not as much for me anymore. It's not my private little clubhouse with my friends. It's everyone's been invited to the clubhouse, which is great. But yep. it, maybe the clubhouse is getting a little too crowded. Maybe I'll step out and get some air for a few yeah, years. Yeah, the fact that back. there's bottle service now has, yeah. has changed the atmosphere a little bit. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I actually kind of like that after a few years, maybe after some of the hype had worn off and Dave was no longer, it, it was pretty clear he wasn't going to be no, number one yes. consistently against Leno. It's like, you know, maybe we can go back to doing a little more quiet, experimental stuff. 
So I, I kind of liked some of the, they, they recaptured a little bit of that as the years went on, I thought. Definitely. Oh my God. The moment that billboard went up and I don't know when it went up, yeah. maybe it was before then too, but the moment that billboard went up for me, uh, you know, with the, the shit eating grin, <laughs> we're yeah. number three or that number three the, in late night. That may have been the funniest thing the show ever did. Um, uh, it was I, so I, good. I, I, I've heard, I'm not positive. I think that may have been Rob Burnett's idea. I, I can't, I was not there. I've just heard about it, but just seeing that picture, it was, it, it really encapsulated everything about Dave and what made him, in my estimation, so much better than Leno, who was a very talented comedian. Yes, yes, of but course. But Dave was just someone who had this other non something else you couldn't identify that just made him really special so um, i'm certain the spice girls had lots of talent but i'm a radiohead fan and i think that yeah. that's where the you know there's there's nuance and different they're different one's pop the other one is 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 more nuanced yeah. i'll tell you about that i i screamed and yelled at why don't they release a poster of that mm -hmm. yeah. i would have a poster of that in my current you know, it yeah. was just so funny. And we had George Schweitzer, who was the head of CBS marketing for right. 50 years. He, he was there forever. We had him on. And, and it was funny because we asked him, I asked him the reaction of that. And he said, uh, at first he was like, what? No. And then he got the joke and was like, oh yeah, okay. We're going to do that. And wrote the check and it was no problem. Like, let's, yeah. let's, let's do this. One of the greatest moments. Uh, and I, uh, and that's in my opinion, where they would go back and do some of these, um, you know, the, the, uh, the, the Tim Thomerson tales from the old West stuff um, that just seemed to make no sense whatsoever. And when he would stop, I don't know if you ever wrote for any of that or not, but I, I just, I, I felt like they, really did a good job of keeping the show really big. Dave is the most powerful man on TV. His interview skills are, 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 are uh, you know, first rate above all. He's more powerful than the guests beside him, but then you guys would do some crazy weird stuff still like, and, and, and I felt like it uh, you're right. The pressure kind of went off. That being said, you're in the writer's room every single day. Yeah. I mean, the pressure must've been nuts. Yeah, yeah, it was absolutely, and uh, I'm sorry again. I think this was a tangent here that 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 uh, okay. got us off track. I'm just happy to um, do this with you. I hope you're having fun. Yeah. I'm having a blast here. Up that, thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah, so um, oh yeah, we were talking about the the, the path of the show. So yeah, the, the, I wrote yes. the second packet. Uh, yes. They asked me to write a second packet, submit that, and then I, I Bob did. Borden, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then Bob Bob called me up on the phone again a few weeks later, saying, "Yeah, they, they <laughs> like the second packet too. Could you come in for an interview?" And, oh, yeah, okay, sure, yeah, okay. So I uh, one day on my lunch break from my job at the magazine, I walked over to the Ed Sullivan Theater and walked into this building. It's like, we're sure I'm allowed in here. I, yeah. I don't, I'm not getting arrested. Hallowed um, grounds. Yeah, and I went up and I had uh, a nice talk with the Stangles for probably about 40 minutes or so where we talked about literally anything but the show. Yeah. Um, and we chatted and I did my best to be at my most normally social you know trying to do my impression of a normal sociable person <laughs> and uh afterward okay thank you very much for coming and they in. saw right out. through that immediately of course. <laughs> they did they did and uh so i left and then i'm waiting to hear back and i'm waiting to hear back and i'm waiting to hear back and i never hear back and you know, i watch the show every night and occasionally they have a long crawl with the credits you can see that the writers did they hire anyone no not yet not yet I, oh yeah there's a new name on the credits there you go that's do you remember That's the was? job I was going for. They hired. Do you remember someone. who it was? Uh, I don't offhand. Okay. Yeah. This, this this would have been uh, early three. Late, yeah, probably early oh three. Yeah. So um, I figured, okay, there you go. You had your chance. You, you you did well enough to get in the room. That's that's good enough. And yeah. you can always say you got an interview. Yeah. So I started making peace with that. I've got a good job at the magazine. It's okay. Finally, I make peace with it after like six or seven months, and then my phone rings again and. It's Bob Borden. <laughs> hey, uh, Stengel's want to know if you can come in for another interview. Oh, no packet or anything. Just come in and talk to him. Oh, okay, sure. Okay. So I go in for another interview and I talk to them. I do my best to do an impression of a normal social person and think it goes okay. I leave and I think, okay, second chance. I really, I really didn't F that one up. I don't know if I can yeah. say certain things on your- on Say your, whatever you want. I don't know what the FCC is monitoring here. Um, <laughs> oh, God, no. They don't even know we exist. They yeah. never will. And uh, so, you know, watch the credits every night. You know, I don't hear back from them. Watch the credits, credits, credits. And there's another new name. So there you go. Again, I have not gotten the job. Yeah. And this is it. I've had two chances. Yeah. This is it. You just get the hint. 
they think you maybe have something. And then every time they meet you, they realize, oh, no, no, there's nothing here. And then like another six months goes by. Bob Ward, call. Come in for an interview. Okay, yeah, sure. Why not? I go in, talk for about 40 minutes, and they offer me the job. So it's like, oh, like I, I had given up multiple times. It was, it was a bit of a roller coaster. Yeah. But they, 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 they eventually uh, hired me. And I don't say this as any kind of grudge or anything. I, I say this with, with endless gratitude um, that they saw fit to bring me in and then bring me in again and bring me again and keep me in mind. Like yep. the first time, I think maybe they hired someone who had certain, almost anyone had better credits than me at that point. One, one time yeah. I think it was someone who yeah. had been at the onion, which yep. of course at that time was huge. And I mean, even now it's a good credit. And I was just working for a local magazine that no one, wasn't even a humor magazine. So yep. of course, um, so I was just endlessly grateful that they remembered me and brought me back. And I really don't care if I'm someone's third choice. I'm happy to be their third choice. I wasn't my wife's first choice. So it's okay. I don't <laughs> care. As long as I, if I eventually get the thing, then that's all that matters. And, and thankfully, God bless them. Eric and Justin uh, gave me the chance when. Another two uh, guys I want to get on here. It, would it be a good idea when I have them on? Should I have them on together? Is that the way to do it with those two? uh that's really more a question for them i don't know no no um, no no. i'm just saying as someone who works, that's on paper to me that seems like it would make sense that they would bounce off each other and all of that i don't know if that's if that's uh, just something i've made up in my mind though you know i yeah i, I really don't know i mean i mean they're both obviously they they, they know a, way more about the show than i ever would and they they could tell you a million stories and they're very good storytellers and they're they're funny people um but yeah, I, I, honestly, if you talk to them separately, you get two shows. So I, I'd suggest that. Well, fair you enough. Know, but fill out the feed a little more. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so so yeah, so again, I'm, I'm endlessly grateful. For the what was your me. first day like, man? What was your first day like when you went there? Like, did you give two weeks notice at the magazine? Did you have anticipation, knowing, or did you instantly say, "Okay, I'm I'm, I'm doing this"? No, 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 like, no, no, no. They they asked me to start on Monday, and I said, "Well, I really got it. I mean, this magazine is they've been really good to me, so I want to give them proper two weeks notice and everything." Yeah. So I, I took that also. A, to give notice, and B, to privately panic for two yeah, weeks. Exactly. Because um, I really did need to get myself ready for this. Um, and then, yeah, my first day, again, I, I remember this. It was April 5th, 2004. Um, I, I uh, you know, I went in. I get my little ID card that I still have somewhere where I look in, ridiculously young and skinny and, 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 <laughs> and terrified. And, uh, yeah, I go in. And uh, I still remember my orientation, which is uh, Bob took me to my office he said uh there's your desk uh write some extras that was my orientation <laughs> so wow. if you ever are a new writer at letterman just know where your desk is and that you need to write extras <laughs> now you may be wondering what are extras <laughs> yeah there there you go like that's an important question that um i asked i said oh, what are extras he says oh, like any little funny things Oh, okay, sure. So what was write some knock knock jokes? What am oh I doing? My God. I don't even know. The wide so open I, field, which is terrifying, as you said. The parameters are way better in, in you know, especially in your first day, you want a parameter or two, right? Yeah. Is I that on best. purpose? Were they rooking you? Um no, 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 no. I don't think so. I don't think anyone was deliberately trying to set me up for failure. No, I think, but I, I, I think it's just, you know, they're all people, they have a job to do. Yeah. You you figure it out and you know, so it's it's tough. You can kind of see maybe why some of the previous writers, like I said, I was their third choice because the previous two guys who they'd hire for that spot were both dismissed after yeah. two or three cycles. Yeah. Um, and that doesn't mean three they were bad week cycles at the time. Thirteen week cycles. Thirteen or sorry, not uh, I meant to say thirteen. Thirteen week yeah. cycles. Okay. It's, yeah. As I believe for decades, even going back, to, I, I've heard yeah. writers for Johnny Carson from the '60s saying. Yeah. Oh gosh, those thirteen week cycles were killer. It's like, yeah. This has always been the way, and and yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, apparently the, the previous two people for that slot had not been able to, to figure things out and that's not necessarily their fault. I mean, there are some super talented people yep. who came through those writer's rooms yep. at, at Letterman and, and didn't last. And, and it's, it's big just, names, big names, hugely yep. talented people. Also some yep. hugely talented people who didn't become big names, but are still really great. Yeah. And it's just a hard thing to latch onto. And, and I'm very lucky I, I, I at least had been watching the show so much over the past 15 years that I at least had a decent sense of his voice. Like I know there were yeah. some writers when I was there over the years who would come in, you'd have a new writer and I'd ask him, oh, hey, you, if you, what, how long have you been watching the show? Did you grow up watching the show? And they said, oh, I never really watched the show. Yeah. Like, Steve oh. Young. Steve Young didn't know who Calvert DeForest was. Yeah. Yeah. So, and uh, well, I think he knew who Calvert was. He just didn't know his, his real name. I think. Oh, maybe that's back, what it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but mind melting. 
Right, we refer to him as too, Calvert. Like, yeah, but back then he was just most the, the viewer would just know him as Larry. Larry, yeah, um, that's right. But yeah, these these writers come in and and they didn't know the show. And it's like, oh gosh, are you going to be okay? I hope you're okay. But if you don't know that, it's it's going to be so much harder. And so at least I had internalized some of Dave's voice. You know, you watch him long enough, you start talking a little bit like him. You start vocabulary. Yeah, all yeah, these things. yeah. yeah. Um, so I I could at least do a very poor man's impersonation of his voice, good enough to get me renewed a few times but um yeah that that first day i know i got a few jokes in the top 10 list i know um i got the act five that day which was very lucky that first just, whoa hold on you got on the first day yeah it, it was the act five so it's, it's like the biggest throwaway piece on the show I, but, yeah uh, well some also considered it the last vestige of where you could throw weird or creative late night stuff in like potato potato like i mean holy cow you yeah. got something on your first day joe yeah, it was fine. No, I, yeah, it, the, the Act 5, I don't remember exactly, but it was some kind of reminder to set your clocks back when it was probably a good six weeks away from daylight savings time or something like that. Um, so not, not the greatest piece, but but good enough to get to get on the air for 15 seconds. Wow. And again, the, the top 10 list was was always something that was um, for better and worse, sometimes formulaic by that point. You know, in, in the, well, in the there's 80s. There's a rhythm, yeah. right? It can't be too long sure. for shorts. Uh, there's a sil- I'm sure there's a syllable count almost, like th- with the rhythm of, of of each and each one, and 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 there's some predictability with that, right? So yeah. you got your you got your framework. Yeah, yeah, and and, and going back, you know, when when, it, when the top ten start, started in the '80s, it was a little yeah. more conceptual, a little more weird, uh, very non topical. But by the time they realized what an effective comedy device it was, and we can just make this a franchise that goes on forever, yeah, it became you know basically another outlet for what are not quite monologue jokes, but not too far off from monologue jokes. Yes. So um, that was something that I, I I could do a decent version of. Um, but like those extras, as they're called, that I never, that took me a long time to even figure out what those were. That took me a long time to really crack properly. It was months or even a couple of years before I felt remotely confident about those. And, 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 and I'm sorry, um, what those turned out to be are... Uh, um, at that point, it was usually done while Dave was at the desk. At the, uh, after the monologue, he'd sit down at the desk. And he might do a few. They'd basically given up on trying to do uh, coherent desk pieces with like yeah. ten jokes, you know, twelve jokes, you know, props or you know, new books or or whatever. Those are too hard to get past Dave. So he decided, well, let's just do like sort of a few little comedy hors d'oeuvres, basically, like like very short, discrete pieces that don't depend on each other. They yeah. could be, you know, give him ten, and he can choose three that don't. There's there's they don't rely on each other to work. So um, yeah, it's it, 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 it's it's tapas basically. It's it's that kind of thing for uh, instead of dinner. Well, here's here you have some you know uh, potato puffs or whatever. Um, well, I'll tell you this. Uh, what what developed for me as a as as an enthusiast uh, who was able to evolve with Dave as he started playing the stadiums and getting bigger and going on tour and all that. If we're using that analogy, I I, I enjoyed that very much. I'll tell you this. Uh, right up till it was. It might have even been 9-11 on now that I think about it, um, although I've never really made that connection. I've been trying to figure out when my very favorite, obviously I would love when he had good interviews and things like that, mm-hmm. but my very favorite segment of the show was the segment right after the monologue. Yeah. Um, and, and eventually, uh, before it was, you know, Paul played me to the desk and, and Paul would do that, but then you guys got to the point where there'd be a commercial break after the monologue and then it was right. it was that first segment. That became... I, I, the only way I can describe it is comfort food for me at the end of a day, whether or not, I mean, I had gone through all sorts of different life at that point. Uh, It doesn't matter ups, downs, whatever I was going through. That was a constant for me was that first segment after the Mm -hmm. monologue. And and that's where extras ended up. Yeah. uh, That's, that's usually where extras were. And then, as you said, when, when they kind of broke up the the monologue in the first act, they moved what would have been the act one stuff in, into the second act after, after the first commercial break. Yeah. Uh, around that time, extras kind of mon- uh, migrated into the monologue. So he'd tell, you know, three or four jokes and he'd say, oh, you know, I saw an interesting thing on television the other day or take a look. Yeah. And uh, he'd show a little videotape piece. Yeah, they're uh, going to be here. Or you'd pop out or like like we just talked about those that. Things. You interrupted the yeah. monologue, yeah. Yeah, so that's sort of, ex- extras became like those little videotape th- things you'd see in the monologue that... Um, you know, fake commercials or promos or a weird doctored clip of a movie, or sometimes it'd be like a live element, as you said, it might, might be me or it might be Alan or it might be, yeah. you know, a Pat Farmer coming out to talk to Dave about some totally irrelevant thing. Um, I, those were the live things we 
generally call those enhancements by that point. I don't know if those previous would have been called extras or not. Okay. I don't know. The terminology is very, very uh, amorphous. Um, but yeah, <laughs> so those extras eventually be became uh, monologue components. And then those were just the bane of my existence for, for many, many, many years. Uh, you know, when I was starting, it's like, okay, come in the morning, you have to have five, basically five pitches for those things. So, um, and you had, I think, 40 minutes to write those. You come in at nine, spend 20 minutes, 10, 10 or 20 minutes writing topics for the top 10 list. And then you start working on extras until like for another 45 minutes to an hour or something like that. Wow. And it what was a trial just, by fire. It really is. It's like, okay, I have an hour, let's say yeah. generously an hour to come up with five good extras ideas. That's 12 minutes a piece. <laughs> okay. So are you, um, are you newspaper boy? Are you like magazines? Are you, I, I became that. Yeah. yeah I, I, yeah. I was, you know, I subscribed to every newspaper in the city and like I, flipping through the New York Post at 5 a.m. trying to find stories to write about. Yeah. Like I would wake up way too early to start doing this because I knew I'm not going to be able to do this in an hour. If they want five ideas, I'm going to need to come in with at least two that I know are okay. And then yeah. hopefully I can, I can just kind of crap out three more on my desk. Um, but yeah, so that was that a was really, really rough time for me. Um, yeah. Not a good time for my mental health, certainly. Um, but, but eventually I sort of caught on and I figured out, okay, I, I guess I can do my own version of this. And I started getting things on, on that part of the show. And uh, so uh, it, 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 most of that pressure was self-imposed because right. I was never told, look, you got to step it up. Okay. You're in trouble here. No one ever did that. No one ever said anything like that. But I was also aware that, you know, I was the third choice because the two other guys had gotten fired after six months or whatever how long did that stay haunting you it sounds like it's even haunting you to this day man <laughs> uh no i i i i'd say after a good three or four years i felt pretty comfortable <laughs> there so you know it's only about as long as you spent in, in high school of, of, <laughs> of, of just me torturing myself uh, um, but also when did you i knew married? what year did you get married uh that was 2011 2011 okay um so but yeah so I, just... I, I was Thankfully, I was single when I got to the show because yeah. I could not have sustained a relationship. I That's kind of where I was going with that a little bit, actually. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it was not good for my mental health or for being around other people. Like my, my whole life was just, oh, God, I, I, have to have, I have to have five ideas tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. And it was, it, was, it was rough. And I also knew that not only had those two writers who had preceded me in that slot not made it, I also had checked the credits and seen, oh, turns out like the last seven or eight writers they've hired were also like no one lasted more than a year. So oh, um, wow, there was a huge turnover. At the, not not a huge turnover. There was a huge turnover in this one slot. The other right. writers, their slots were all stable. You had Steve Young, you had Tom Rupert, Lee Ellenberg, um, Jeremy started the same time as me. But they were, they were looking a hard for time. another family member, and they had they hard time, having a hard time filling out that that extra seat in the room. And that's when Jeremy and I started around the same time, and we were the two who stuck around. And even though like the next seven eight writers they hired after us didn't last very yeah. long so it's like we're this maybe we got lucky in terms of timing i think it helps that we both i, I had a fairly good handle on on dave's voice yeah but uh yeah it, it is a lot of pressure and like i said most of it is self-imposed but you also know that that you know they, they don't they're not gonna let you coast forever so yeah. sure um were you the little brother in some respects were you the uh, kid I, brother? I kind of felt that way i mean i was yeah you know like i i was 28 jeremy and i are both about the same age yeah. Uh, and then everyone else was at least five years older, probably, and some 10, 15 years older. So yeah. I felt like the kid in the room for a very long time. And, and for a long time, I was the newest writer because whoever they hired after me, they keep firing them. So yeah. like four or five years, stuck. Yeah. I'm still the new guy. And at that time, at that time, there was no hazing or anything involved, thankfully. Yeah. But they did have one traditional thing for uh, the new writer at that time. It's the most boring thing imaginable. But anytime they were doing a Chiron quiz, do you know what those are? It's like they they do like oh let's do the Thanksgiving parade quiz or something like that. Here's oh, a bunch okay, of B roll. Yeah. They show yeah. B roll of of the, the parade or they show B roll of the uh, the New York Auto Show or or whatever. And then here we see a scene of A straight line B straight line C joke about what you're sure. saying. Call those Chiron quizzes. And to do those, uh, we had to screen just hours and hours of footage of, of you know we'd send a camera crew out just to film the most boring things imaginable, and you have to try yep. to find little gems in there. <laughs> and the tradition was the newest writer will be the one who operates the tape machine as we're screening the footage. It's not a bad thing. It's not cruel or anything. It's just you're sitting there at this 40-year-old beta machine, yep. VTR, they called it, um, and rewinding it and pause. They didn't really even have a pause. You had to, uh, um, so for five years, I was the new guy. It's like, I've been here for five years. Why am I still in the, 
But, you know, again, it, it wasn't a bad thing. Everyone was, was very nice. It was just weird to still be the new guy for that long. Who did but you eventually, give it to after you? Uh, actually, I think we stopped doing Chiron quizzes. So I was there probably the last, okay. the last. <laughs> you retired it. You retired the segment and the tradition. Congratulations. Um, but I don't know if another writer really stuck until, I don't, I don't even know who it was, but it was probably 2009, 2010. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, the, the first three cycles or so, I was probably worried. Um, but they were always very nice. The Stengels were always very nice to call me in and say, hey, just so you know, you're doing fine. Oh, um, that's great. Even if, don't worry about what you get on the show. I would say, was there anything I should be doing differently? I mean, it could give me advice. I wish they'd give me some feedback, but their feedback was always, don't worry. Yeah. You're doing fine. And and again, maybe maybe they were just tired of firing people or reading submissions. <laughs> like, you know, let's just give someone a chance and see if they can stick. I don't know. But uh, for whatever reason, um, after a year or two, I feel like, okay, I, I think I'm safe. I still hate writing extras every morning, but I think I don't have to worry about getting fired. Yeah. So it made it easier on those days. When there, there were many days when I got nothing on the show. Yeah. And it's it's fine for a day or two, but if it gets to day three where you've got nothing on the show, you start to wander. And sometimes you get a bad streak. It's a week long. It's like, you know, uh, it makes you question a lot of things. But yeah. I it's appreciate all- you talking about this, including, by the way, uh, I got my podcasting chops or what podcasting chops I have um, because I host a men's mental wellness podcast. And, mm-hmm. and, and, and so that is very dear to me my wife's building a men's mental wellness app called he changed it and i i I contribute uh very little but i do contribute by hosting the podcast to it it's a whole bunch of smarter people than me that want to change the world and 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 um it's funny how in my the things that i've learned in my whole life is that comedy and mental health seem to always kind of go hand in hand in many ways and i think part of it is also because um people use humor as an outlet so much yeah and it's just uh you know comedy in my opinion comedy is a, is a device for mental wellness in many ways to get things off your chest and to and to um you know to get things out in a semi-positive way Can um, be, yeah. you know I, I appreciate you even talking about you know the the struggles of that it looks like a hard job that would be taxing on your mental health <laughs> yeah th- there's a lot of rejection and a lot of Yes. Uh, and, and a lot of the judgment really comes more from yourself than from the outside. Like people will rarely say to you, this joke sucks. Yeah. But then you sometimes wonder, wonder yourself, oh, geez, this joke, does this joke suck? I think it sucks. And are they just being nice? They're too polite to tell me how terrible I am. Yeah. Um, and yeah, yeah you know, sometimes that was the that. case. <laughs> there were times when that was certainly the case. Um, but usually <laughs> it's like, you know, if someone else pitches a bad idea in the room, we all do it. We all have those moments. And it's not like, oh, that person sucks. It's like, oh, geez. It wasn't me this time. It's going to be yeah. me next time. Yeah. But it wasn't me this time. And that I think helps you be a little more supportive when someone else just, sometimes you just have to pitch an idea that, that you know it's not good, but if you start silently for the whole meeting, well, that doesn't look good either. So you just got to put out whatever you got. Yeah, um, you know, but I think also, it also is insurance that you don't get a big head as well. Yeah. Like, oh, it I definitely mean, keeps you humble. Yeah. Yeah. And I know, I, I've, again, I've listened to your interviews with, with, with so many other writers and it's come up. Uh, the, the Letterman writers don't like compliments. They don't take... Uh, they don't take praise very well. It ain't but just really, the writers there, brother. It's a no, lot, it, not, almost Sue Hum the other day would not take a compliment from me to save her life. Uh, you know, it seems to be everybody. It seems to be the family dynamic, man. Yeah. Well, I mean, there are a lot of people like that in any business or outside of any industry, but certainly at Letterman that there was, I think it attracted and also uh, uh, sort of nurtured those kinds of people. Like it, it was a safe place to be that kind of person. Um, oh, that's cool. Yeah. So it, it was like, but there, there weren't a, a whole lot of compliments forthcoming because we all knew, you know, you, you could see someone like that was that was a great bit. But then the book for response was, eh, yeah, you know, it's fine. I guess. Look at the time. The we got another show tomorrow night. You know, it's, it's like it's like if you say to Dave, you know, oh, that, that was a great show last night. What do you think of the show? He said, like, well, I guess it's stuck to the tape. You know, it's that sort of thing. Yeah. So we all have that same sort of mentality of, well, you know, we did well enough today. But again, yeah, you got to come back tomorrow. So, um, yeah. I, I, it, I, Speaking of coming back, like I, I want to be, I'm trying my best to, to, to construct a show. I could talk to you for six hours. I am limitless. Yeah. I'm the energizer bunny when it comes to this stuff here. I want to be very uh, cognizant though, that we're, we're putting on a show that I want everyone to listen to the whole thing. And, and sure. so I hate the fact that I'm even saying these words. I hope we can do this again. Um, because yeah. I mean, I've got so many questions. Uh, yeah. Like, 
but I do have a couple that I would like to visit before we leave, if that's okay. Sure. Um, the last one I'm going to ask you, just so you're aware, things that you wrote that you're particularly proud of. That's kind of one of the last ones I'm going to ask you, and I'm going to get your brain, your subconscious moving on that before I say this next one. The, uh, the other guys, whether or not you are the kid brother, whatever it is, hey, let's get Joe on the air. He's got this thing. We write some things for him. Uh, you had a pattern of, of, of things that you would do. Um, well, yeah, you know, this one just popped into my head. So I'm going to ask it, um, was the little piece of business where, where, when Dave would kick you off stage and you would turn and look and try and go the other way behind yeah. stage, was that piece of business yours or was that written for you? Um, no, I, I have to ask that question. I'm sorry. I, I think Tom Ruprecht was the first person to put that into one of my pieces. <laughs> okay. Um, again, I apologize. This may have been Lee and Jeremy's thing. I think it was Tom who did it first yep. and then Lee and Jeremy ended up putting it in all of those, my the closest thing I had to a recurring bit was was me reading little jokes from the notebook, oh, and uh, yeah. Lee and Jeremy wrote pretty much all. I, I would, you know, I, I'd contribute a little bit to the scripts here and there, but but they wrote almost all of those. Um, well, you they so, didn't perform it though, sir. So let me the, do the compliment no, no. here. The piece of business where you would turn towards the desk and start walk. It was expertly. Expertly well, performed. Fan it, I would I would laugh out loud almost every time. So it, it, it didn't it, get it, boring. It, it was nice to give Dave one more reason to get angry at me. Like, before <laughs> I left. Like, he already hates me. Let me just give him one more little thing. No, no, that way, that way. So. Okay, so that question was just kind of thrown in. The question sure. where I was going, and then I had to ask that one. The fan in me just had to come out and ask that. Uh, was you had these guys uh, writing for you? Okay, give it to Grossman. Put put. They think it's funny to put you on there. Was there anybody who you did that to that you wrote something for somebody else uh, to to kind of return the favor? Not consciously, maybe, but oh yeah, this would be good for this person. That team mentality. Uh, on the writing staff or anywhere on the anywhere on the in the store the in the in the, uh, in the store the production the you know, behind the scenes in front of the whatever and it wasn't really even a, a matter of like paying it forward it was more just always it, 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 when you're writing for this kind of show and you got to fill an hour every day it's yeah, always yeah. good to have cast characters basically that you can turn to so it's yes. not just as, as great as Dave is it's you want to look at other people occasionally and see this show or is see about him Dave and company see him and interact with other people like like yes, that's. Sir. It's not just Dave on his own. It's how does Dave react to Alan? How does he react to Tony Mendez? Yep. How does he react with Biff? So anytime you can find a new character or, or, or build things out, it, it helped us. So yeah, I, I would write for all the characters we had. I don't know if I established any new characters. Um, but yeah, we would. I write for- Pat, I mean, Sue, like who were we talking yeah, here? No, I, yeah. I, anyone. I, I, I did things for Alan. I did things for Pat. I did things for Biff. Uh, one of Rupert, those. did you ever do anything for Rupert? Sponsor Absolutely. the show, by the way. This I did lots of things for Rupert. Rupert. I, 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 I shot things with him in his deli. I, I wrote yeah. lots of silly bits for him. I, I wrote things for you know some less like like a you know Bill DeLace or you know Brian nice. Teda used to come Chief. on as like as yeah or, or you know Brian Ted I think you know him he, he used yeah, to come well, on as, as yeah. the sort of the weird nervous quiet kid like a not not too far off from my own character just like a you know a little here's here's another awkward nervous guy so sitting um, in Anton's lap. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it was just a matter of who is it who we can find some kind of interesting dynamic to interact with Dave. So so the, the more characters you can find on a show, the more it gives the writers to work with. And uh, again, that's something you don't see as much on the shows now, because I, I, I guess the whole, you know, let's, the shows aren't, don't do as much of the, the supporting characters as they used to, which maybe is a good thing, because it was such a Dave thing that very Might much seem so too derivative now kimmel yeah. does some of it you know because he's yep. obviously a huge letterman fan he's probably the best advocate out there for for dave there is yeah uh, but yeah you don't see as much of it anymore uh okay so so um I, I do want to visit this with you really quickly, and maybe maybe this is something that we we move into more in part two. But the legend of uh, of the post mortem, and it seems to have evolved throughout the mythos and as as it's grown and, and as it's changed. Um, were you ever part of a post post like the post mortem that we heard about when you and I were kids? That you know, Dave coming in after the show, not being happy with it, all of that. I don't want to get negative necessarily with this, yeah. but but the dynamic of after. Uh, the show with the post-mortem, were you ever a part of that? Uh, I was never part of any meeting with Dave. Uh, okay. If that's what you're talking about, like actually with Dave or just the writers talking about how well, the show Well, I mean, you know, whether it's a trickle down, you know, Dave goes in and talks yeah. to the producers and then suddenly, okay, they're in the writer's room and and, and this yeah. has kind of come down from a from a reaction. Yeah, we'd, we'd totally have meetings after the show. Uh, the, the writers, you know, not every night, but either after the show or the next day that our head writers would come in and say, yep. okay, so, you know, Dave didn't like this or Dave wants to see more of this. We totally hear it, but it would always come mediated through them. Like we didn't, 
we were not in yeah. meetings with Dave. Dave was not coming in the morning and hanging out and saying, hey, hey, what's up, Joe? What do you got for me today? Sure. You know, it wasn't like that. Yeah. Um, I didn't. Did you see it I more did... on camera than off? Yes, absolutely. There it is. Okay. Uh, yep. And I don't say that as a criticism because honestly, no. I, God, no. I think I think it was better for me that way because I would have been too intimidated to be around Dave. So it was much easier for me to, again, it's the coward's way of writing jokes. Like, I don't want to be around the guy who has to deliver them. I just want to anonymously slip them to him. It, you know, I got my start mailing in jokes. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, yeah. I, I, I work best from a distance away from the line of, of fire. I um, totally get that. And I think a lot of folks there uh, related to that. I don't, uh, yeah, I, I, I love yeah. that. That's part of the culture. Um, there's no commentary pro or against it's that's, that was the culture right. of the show, which is exactly why this show exists. Uh, you know, and so many people have said to me many off camera too, uh, you know, I saw more Dave on camera than I did Absolutely. off camera and I worked and I with did, him for decades. <laughs> I did see him off camera now and then I, sure. I wasn't, I, I, I first ran into him maybe three or four months into my time there. And it was just at the end of the day and I was leaving at like whatever, eight or nine o'clock at night and I get in the elevator and, I don't, and the elevator door opens and oh geez, it is Dave's floor. Please don't let it be Dave. Please don't let it be Dave just because I don't know what I'm going to do. And of course, Dave steps on. It's just him and me for 12 <laughs> floors and he sees I'm carrying a newspaper. So he says, he doesn't know who I am, by the way. Yeah. I, I think he assumes I'm an intern because I look like I'm 12 years old. And he, he sees the newspaper and says, ah, where'd you get that newspaper? And I said, uh, I brought it from home. And he said, Good answer. We've had a lot of problems with people stealing papers. <laughs> okay, and he, he was just joking. It wasn't like Dave there was no Letterman one worried makes about. Makes a joke to you in the elevator, but it's like, like, yeah, that was my first interaction, and it was it was a good one because I gave him a chance to sort of do what he does last, what, what he really likes, which is which is kind of teasing staffers. And yes. for all the talk you hear about, oh, staffers told not to look at Dave, don't make eye contact. Yeah, I don't think that ever came from anyone. In Dave's office, I think it came from people who were trying to protect Dave without knowing what he wanted. Because um, mm. I know from my own experience and from other experiences, it would be much worse if you were passing, passing Dave in the hallway and you didn't say hi. Like he might be a, like, like why, why wouldn't people? I once, and this is, uh, this is like toward the end of the show. It's probably, sure. yeah, I'd been there for eight or nine years. He knew who I was. Um, I was going down the stairs to the 12th floor between the writer's yeah. floor and Dave's floor just to drop something off in someone's office. And I see Dave coming out of his office. So I'm only like a few steps down. I figure, you know what? Let me just turn around and go back upstairs so I don't have to <laughs> bother him. Like I, I'm, I'm, I'm still afraid of him after eight years. Sure. And I was just a little too slow because he heard someone turn around and go back upstairs. And he said, why are people avoiding me? Am I that awful? It's like, oh God, no. Now I've made him feel bad. It's like, no, no, it's fine, Dave. I just forgot something in my office. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> so he was being Which is normal. great because you turned it into a joke now. Now it is a joke uh, because you forgot something in your office. And I was trying to play it off. Like, no, I get no, it. Like, yeah. Uh, and you but, did. Yeah. <laughs> but again, he was being socially normal and very sure. gracious. And I'm the one who's making it weird. So, you know, for, for all... You know, every time I did interact with Dave outside of the show, he was very friendly. I mean, and he could be as well as, as famous as he is for being tough on certain people. And there were certainly times when he could be very, sure. very hard on people. It was almost always directed at the top level people. It's the head writers, the executive producers, the the director, certainly, you know, um, the people who are really, really high up on the ladder and and not that you should be contentious with anyone no. but he was always super nice to anyone below that level if, if you were um you know the, the, the kid delivering the mail yeah. or the guy running the elevator the, the freight elevator that he liked to ride in you know he couldn't have been nicer and sweeter and, and more uh congenial i was gonna uh, ask if you've ever ridden that elevator was that the elevator you were that wasn't the elevator you were talking about though yeah that, that, yeah he liked he liked using the, the freight elevator which yeah. had the manual lever yeah. to go up and down yeah and uh, he would operate it himself uh, I, I I certainly did write a few times, but uh, not with him in it. It was just yeah. oh, the regular elevators are out. So George Clark is uh, going to take everyone up and down in this crazy rickety uh, thing from 1931. So yeah. you know, um, but yeah. So, so whenever I did see Dave, he was he was very friendly and he was much better at he was much more engaging than I would have expected. Like I'm terrible at small talk, right. um, so I I tend to make it weird. Uh, I I remember one time the first time I had to pre-tape something with him or it was post-tape it was after the show but it's yeah. pre-tape post-tapes um some little bit we were doing together in uh what we were pretending was his office and so we, we set up everything in the office um and everyone's all set and then dave is the last one to come in so they can just shoot it quickly and get him in and out 
Yeah. So I'm sitting there thinking, okay, don't be weird around Dave. Don't be weird around Dave. Don't be weird around Dave. Finally, everything's set up. Dave walks in, says the most normal thing in the world. He says, oh, lovely weather we're having today, isn't it? And it's like, is he talking to me? Is he talking to someone else? He can't be talking to me because he doesn't even know who I am yet. I'll wait for someone else to talk. So two seconds go by. No one, no one says anything. And uh, Dave says, okay, I guess I'll just go fuck myself. <laughs> and it's like, oh, geez. <laughs> and again, he was just okay, being... Does that break up the room? Did everyone start laughing at that point? Like Instantly, the yes. director, Jerry Foley, thank God, Jerry Foley says, oh, it's a great day. Oh, my God. Yes, yeah, isn't it beautiful outside? He stepped <laughs> in and saved me. And again, Dave wasn't being a jerk there. He was just no. making a joke. I don't want this to be like, oh, you know, former Letterman writer says he was he abused step. No, not at all. He was just yeah, no, 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 no. He was no. calling attention to this this weird, awkward moment in a very funny way. Yeah. And of course, it was funny. I laughed too. Yeah. And actually, I have video of this somewhere because the camera was rolling when it happened. Uh, so I, I can there was the the audio was not running, so we can't see it, but you can read his lips and see my reaction. And it's like uh, I, I've watched this a hundred times. Like, oh God, what's oh, wrong? That's delightful. That is so. What a souvenir that that's that. Okay. I was uh, one of the questions. Did you keep anything from the show? That That is one of the greatest souvenirs yeah. I could ever even imagine being an enthusiast of, of this man that you got a chance to work for that. That's lovely. Yeah. So any awkwardness that there was with Dave was almost always coming from people who are overthinking their interactions. Sure. Them, oh, should I make eye contact with him? Am I not supposed to make eye contact? No, just treat him like a person. You always said, if you ever see him, just don't call him Mr. Letterman. That was the one rule I was called. Just call him Dave. Don't call him Mr. Letterman. Okay, that, that's the one thing I was told. But aside from that, it's just, you know, if you see him in the hall, you, you don't want to go up to him and, and, and talk his ear off. But no, you can make a little bit of small talk. You can, you know, he'd ask, you know, it, it, just be friendly, just be normal. After reading Carter's books and things like that, and, and again, like, I mean, I think these things evolved over time as well. And, and and apparently, you know, the difference from 30 Rock to CBS, we are on different floors, you know, in 30 Rock, they were all on one floor. And, and, and I've had people who've talked yeah. to me about the differences there. But I'll tell you this, I always thought, um, because again, I, I live vicariously through through you guys, Brian Teddy, you talk about that, I live vicariously through that. Um, it's like, oh, my God, they're doing what I would dream of doing. Yeah. And I don't know what I would have done for the show, but I, I certainly just dreamt that I wanted to be part of that family. And, yeah. and um, I always imagined that if I saw Dave in the hall, every single time we were walking past each other, I always imagined all I would do is I'd just put my hand up for a high five just to see if he'd high five and just keep walking. If not, uh, I don't know if it would ever would have <laughs> happened or not, but I had that in my head that that's what I would do if I were one of those staffers. You know, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I don't know what would have happened. Um, <laughs> I would not have done that, but I think uh, we've, we've established that we should not use me as a more role model for these kinds of things. I have this weird positive optimistic thing that it's just, I have this unlimited capacity for energy and optimism and positivity. So I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know if it would have gone either, but in my mind, and I've got a bit of a crazy mind too. You talk about fun facts. I make up fun facts to my wife all the time and hopefully they'll stick, like she'll actually believe them and yeah. tell others. And if she does, it's like the greatest, it's like a field goal. It's the greatest thing ever. I, I, I'm bent yeah. too. So that was always the way that I thought that I would, you know, if ever I was in your shoes, I, I'm a weird guy. Um, have you kept up with my next guest? You know, I haven't very much. I've watched a little bit of it. Yeah. And I, I kind of feel bad for it because it's like, oh, Dave is still out there. Dave, Dave is, you know, he didn't disappear like Johnny did. He's yeah. out there. He has, yeah, it's only whatever, six shows a year, but still something. And I haven't, and there was the, the, the comedy thing he was doing for Netflix also, which I, I have been meaning to watch. I just haven't gotten around to it. Um, but I, I haven't watched the show much. I, I, I find the sh I, I, my favorite part of the show was always the comedy yeah. or Dave just being weird. And the, the, the little bit of, of the Netflix show I did watch, it's like, oh, it's, it's Dave doing not the most heavy interviews, but still serious Tom interviews. Tom Snyder. Yeah, I like yeah. that kind of Tom Snyder, the, the Bob Costas things. Yeah. I like that kind of stuff. But just watching him, it's like, oh gosh, I just love to see him do a few jokes here or something like that. He, yeah. he drops little jokes into the, the interviews. Or maybe, maybe it's gotten more comedic since I, I stopped watching. Um, but no, I would even like. Even Chappelle's, uh, you know, again, one of the greatest comic minds of any generation. Even sub And I love that episode more than anything. That episode is my favorite by far. Um, I mean, it gets heavy. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's, 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 it's definitely uh, got a level of depth to it that's way above. Now, you mentioned that's my time with David Letterman. I, I went down and and, and was, uh, uh, you know, uh, blessed enough to go down and see them tape that. Yeah. Uh, you know, you got Dave doing a monologue again, and, and I'm sitting there looking around, and it's it's on a video, but there's the cue cards of, of the very similar 
point form way that he used to do it. And it's, it's, it's Dave doing a monologue and, yeah, and, and I got a chance to see three of them that night. It was absolutely fucking delightful. It was, it, it felt, it felt a little bit like the old show. Yes. Um, and I love that. So that I think, I think I you're in for a treat. You'll give yourself a treat for those six episodes when you see I them. should definitely check that out. Um, but yeah, just, just the idea of, of the interviews, <laughs> Uh, you know, Dave, Dave was a very good interview on the show, but it was just yeah. not my favorite part of the show. And I, I remember, like, I always felt a little, again, it was another one of those sort of old show versus new show things. Like, when the guests became the focus, I sort of lost interest. I, I, want, I want to see Dave. I want to see the, the, the family at the show. You know, yeah. I, I don't really care so much about the movie star or whatever. And, like, I always think about, like, the, the old show, the, the, the difference between the NBC show and the CBS show. It's been said, I, I don't know if it was in the Zinneman book or something, yeah. that the original show was a comedy show within the format of a talk show, but the CBS show is more of a talk show that had comedy elements in it. And I really yeah. felt like that's what it became. So I, I missed those comedy elements a lot. But like, if you watch the old show, like they used to do the anniversary shows every year, and it'll be packed with highlights, all these great clips of all the great stuff they'd done, all the right comedy bits, the, the remotes, the crushing stuff with the press, yeah. the you know reviewer mail segments and stuff. But when Dave went off the air in 2015 and you saw all these, these highlight reels of his 20, two years at, at CBS, almost everything was from guest segments. It was, you know, Joaquin Phoenix, it was uh, uh, Drew Barrymore, Madonna, and, and, and or it was the, the, the moments when reality entered the show, like, like the 9-11 remarks or heart yeah. surgery or, 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 or the- uh, uh, The bear. The, the, the bear, well, the bear was great. <laughs> the bear was there, yeah. But, but, but like, 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 like the extortion scandal or something, like, like everything yeah. was, yeah. there was no comedy that was being remembered from the CBS years. It was all just- Big, yeah. The stuff that didn't interest me much. So, so I, I, to me, like the best stuff was always just the comedy. Which, again, as much as I love the CBS show and having been part of the show, yeah, I'm also aware that pretty much anything that anyone remembers comedically from the show, from Dave's 33 years, 32, whatever it was, almost all their favorite comedy memories will probably be from NBC, and 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 that goes for me as well. So, um, yeah, but yeah, I I, I like. I like any Dave and I like that he's still out there and I really would like to catch up on some other stuff because uh, it, it would, yeah. I'm, um, I'm just glad he still exists. I appreciate your point of view there. I will tell you this. Uh, if I was to go through many of my top comedy moments, I would pick late show moments. But again, that's where I'm a little bit of a, uh, it, it's a lot of folks don't, there's a lot of folks like me who late show was their tonight show and, yeah. and, and late night was the a different part. And, and I look at them almost equally and I know I'm in the minority with, with a lot of people. Like I, I get that, but, um, oh my gosh, our, I can, I can probably list 20 late show moments that made me roll on the floor laughing well, quite literally, not just the acronym that you see on texting, but literally just got me so good. Um, and I know you wrote many of them. Next time we talk about this, uh, we talk, we'll, we'll get into some of the specific things that maybe you wrote. Uh, um, and I'll save it. Cause I gotta, I mean, I'm probably going to two part this one, which is again, like Joe, you have no idea how much, maybe you do. I think you probably do actually know how much of a thrill this is for me. Okay. Um, uh, this has been like amazing and I can't wait to do this more if possible. Sure. Uh, I am going to ask you about one more thing then. Um, uh, my favorite run, I think because it is, it felt like a coda um, in 2010 and don't get me wrong. The, the, the last, uh, this, you know, just another plug to Scott Ryan. Sure. This is my favorite week, uh, favorite run of any TV show or any broadcasting uh, show ever. The last six weeks of your show, I thought yeah. was just masterful it's my favorite run of anything uh in entertainment ever and i'm a giant star wars fan and all these sorts of things that last six weeks of late show was my favorite it was mm -hmm. so good but um 2010 mm -hmm. when uh the late shift the sequel happened oh yeah and i mean <laughs> i i if something happens i get struck by a bolt of lightning tomorrow and i save this for the next show i'm gonna be pissed at myself uh, because that to me, and Dave facetiously said it to Conan O'Brien, you know, that was the golden age of television. It was. I, for me, it kind of was. I just, yeah. oh my God. It was, and I, I love Conan so much. And it yeah, was me too. so heartbreaking to see how, how he was treated. Yes. And yes, I know there's a side to be made for how Leno was in some ways also treated poorly in yep. the lead up to him. And yes, really NBC just, figured out how to make the worst decision every step of the way. Yes, um, but, yes. but really, 
But seeing how badly it's spent and how humiliated Conan was publicly, it was so painful. But having seen just everything you know about Jay Leno <laughs> being reinforced, like, oh, it's the guy we've seen doing exactly the kind of thing you would expect him to do. It was so much fun just throwing rocks at that whole yes, story. Yes, and okay, awesome. Fun at it. We're not um, disparaging and- Mr. Leno. We're not disparaging anybody saying this. We're just talking about what happened at that point. And it was you guys lobbing apples yeah. like you wouldn't believe. Oh my gosh. Yeah, as long as something horrible is happening, at least we can have some, try to have some fun with it and hopefully do it in a way that's respectful to Yes. Uh, especially to Conan, because the you know I just I loved Conan so much, and I still do. And, Me too. Uh, seeing what that happened, but yeah, we 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 had so much fun every night. Just another thing about what 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 did Leno do today? I remember I had one idea. Now, this is actually a couple of years later, uh, after the whole thing had collapsed and Conan had gone yeah. to TBS, he came back to as guest on Letterman one night. Yes, sir. And there was that great pause. Where he walks out, and it's just like a minute of Dave and Conan just not saying you know, anything. You know, Dave's watching. Um, so we we all had to you know I, I think we were supposed to I don't I don't know if we were supposed to pitch but we knew Conan was on the show that night so we just uh, uh you know I, I remember one idea I pitched that didn't happen but we talked about it was just Dave saying oh but you, you know Conan's here tonight and you, I don't I just feel like I don't know why I just know Jay is somehow up to something <laughs> I, I, just look what I saw this afternoon and I wanted to get whatever the oldest weirdest car in the world is and have it just circling the block all night as if. Leno is, we, we know he's going to do something here. He's going <laughs> to screw this up for us somehow. And I think it didn't happen because we couldn't get the car. But you, you, just, you just want some kind of Duesenberg or something. Yeah. Something that's. That, a Duesenberg you know, would have been perfect. Yeah. Absolutely. That would have been the perfect car. Something yes. that runs, runs on steam. Well, and Carter um, talks about it in, 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 uh, in late shift too. So that, that's a perfect, that would be the perfect car. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but also, but when the whole thing was happening, like every night we just had so much to work with. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I know, what did we do? Uh, well, we did, uh, one, uh, it was, it was uh, when NBC announced, okay, we're 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 canceling the the 10 p.m. Leno show, yep. and, and now they're in trouble because they have nothing to fill five hours of prime time. Yep. So they're going to have to start. They said, oh, the, okay, like I, I guess they were planning to just start for now, uh, fill it up with Law and Order episodes. Yeah. So we did this little thing. It was a silly. It was it was my pitch. It was okay. Well, they got to have this new Law and Order thing to fill in five hours. So it was this thing called Law and Order uh, Leno Victims Unit. Yes. And it was just the preamble. You know, in the television industry, there are two kinds of talk show hosts. Uh, uh, whatever host uh jay leno and those who have been victimized by jay yeah. leno these are their stories and it was supposed to be the whole you know in the style of the law and order intro going through yeah. every host leno had screwed over over the years so it's supposed to be starring johnny starring dave starring conan jimmy fallon and then uh ice t as carson daly was the one <laughs> and then uh we, I guess it was considered a little bit ungracious. They, they took out Dave and Johnny and just kept the other people in there. Okay. But uh, I, I know that that was a, a thing that got a little bit of attention. That was, that was kind of fun to do. Was um, Ed Hall, you, one of them you brought Ed oh, Hall back for. <laughs> we did start booking Ed Hall for voiceovers. Uh, <laughs> Which is great because he was with you guys in the first place and went over and came like, like it's fun and it's funny and it wasn't, Oh yeah. Anyway, and I, yes. I don't want to speak on Ed Hall's behalf because I just barely know him. I've only met him yeah. a few times. He's a very nice guy. Yeah. But I feel like you could probably add him to the list of people who maybe um on this were... show. Oh, we're going back and forth no, 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 already. No, no, yeah, no, but, but 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 people who maybe Leno didn't uh, treat as well oh, uh, toward I the end as possible. I, I, okay. I, I, I don't know everything about the way that ended, but it sounds like it wasn't great. Mm-hmm. Um the other thing we did that I that I really liked was because but by that time we had done the thing uh, uh, several times where I'd come out and tell the jokes about you know, Obama that are actually about John McCain or Barack Obama is so old, whatever, or about George W. Bush. This so is one of my I, favorite segments I, 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 to talk about right here. I, I, I think this. I think it was my pitch. Uh, to, uh, let's do a version where it's, uh, you know, everyone's talking about the, the Lennon Conan thing and everyone's talking about what a bad guy Lennon is, but you know, there are two sides. Let's not blame Conan, right? So everyone's saying, let's not blame Conan. Well, let's, you know, let's take a look at Conan here. So let's, let's do some jokes about what, what, what Conan has done wrong. So then I come out with my, we, we, one of our writers has figured out a way to, he's really cracked the code on how to do jokes about what Conan has done wrong here. So it's me with an old notebook doing jokes about Conan and all his crazy cars that he has and how he screwed <laughs> over all these hosts his and, job. you know, and he and his wife Mavis, you know, so uh, that, that was kind of fun. But the, okay. But the funniest part about that though, was not you throwing a rock at Jay Leno. 
The funniest part about that was you throwing a rock at the end of Dave. Uh, we have to, it's something about it being a mummy. It was Dave is so old or Conan is so oh, old wow. that, and it was actually a crack about Dave and not Jay. That's right. That was the, that was the, the, the yeah. Okay. I forgot about that. You're right. Yes. And, and, and that to me, that was the funnest part about that was that you then just turned right around and threw the best rock at Dave. Uh, I yeah. just, oh my God, I love that so much. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, again, it it's real that's a, by the affection that i have for you guys uh, yeah. i love those moments i love that i went over to uh um, don giller's apartment a couple of weeks ago I, my wife and i made the trip to new york that was a lot of fun he has the uh one of the greatest uh you know i've got some jackets and some cool things for the show we're doing the studio i got a bridge one of your bridges that's going to be a part of the background love that he has one of the greatest uh souvenirs from the late show i could ever imagine he has the joe grossman flip book um oh wow yeah <laughs> that cartoon you know the flip book where it's a cartoon I, of oh my god i don't know how just... he got that uh the the <laughs> whoever's listening to this uh that was a a crisp holiday gift that steve young made like usually most years we would give each other kind of silly gifts you know yeah. so one year steve young had a custom flip book made of me just sitting there not moving <laughs> so it's uh it's a very Steve Young joke. It's a very good encapsulation of a Steve Young joke. And it was, yep. it was an honor to be the inspiration for one of his uh, jokes. But yes, that's, that's, I have one of those two on my bookshelf here. So fantastic. Uh, yeah. I just, I love it so much. Um, and, and you know what? The footage of me in Don's apartment flipping through that is available on the episode where I forget one of our previous episodes. Anyway, um, it's, it's fantastic. I might even throw it out on as a, as a quick YouTube video after this. Um, listen, Joe, I, you've been so gracious with your time here. Uh, I just got to tell you, um, I thought full frontal with Samantha B was phenomenal as well. You. you moved on. This is where you went, uh, right after late show. Did you get, did you kind of get caught on there right away? Or is it uh, later, I, was, later? I was in the wilderness for about six months looking for work. And then okay. thank God this new show just happened to start up and yeah. they needed to fill a a very small but good writer's room so I, I yes. managed to get on staff there and I, I I was there for the full seven year run and it was a really 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 great opportunity great place to you know, see that oh you know what I've been writing for Dave for 11 years I don't know if I'm capable of doing anything else and yeah okay turns out I can okay that's good did they, did they ever say to you we want a letterman sensibility no no I okay just, uh, I, they they you know appreciated and respected that I had that but it was never like yeah. uh let's bring it some of that here. It's, like, it's like that this is going to be a very different show. It's obviously yes. much more, uh, much more aggressive, much more uh, yeah. uh, uh, confrontational. But, you know, this thing that's taking real stances on issues. Uh, yeah. So it was. We found room for silliness within all that stuff, but uh, yeah, it was it was very different, and I was very lucky and happy to get to prove myself doing something different. Yeah, a tremendous show, and 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 like, look at the resume you have. You have very few things on that resume because they're all just at the top of the heap of of, of entertaining. And and I mean, well, it's very few things because I don't like to leave a job. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I always say, if you hire me for a show, I will go down with the ship. That's why yeah. I did it at Letterman. I did it full frontal. If I can manage to stick around at, at, at the Tonight Show, I'll I'll be there and, and, and until uh, until NBC collapses. I don't know, whatever. Uh, I'm I'm you'll i will have to be asked to leave is what i'm saying so you don't um, leave a good job no well and and i mean you've had great ones you have a great one now uh i love fallon i love fallon when he was on snl like i, I love conan too like i mean these yeah. are these are amazing things i think fallon weekend update bits uh fallon is so unbelievably talented uh you know and again this is what pops into my head. Jimmy Fallon on the late show imitating Tom Brokaw. And I mean, I don't even want to, I, I, the last time he was on, I think uh, on panel with Dave hysterical, that appearance was hysterical. I know it talks about uh, you know, who Caitlyn Jenner is now and all that, but at the time when that incident happened, it's like, Oh my gosh, this is two Titans just going back and forth. Uh, his doing his, uh, his Neil Young is the Fresh Prince song. Uh, I mean, the, the talent that Jimmy Fallon has is just tremendous. And the fact that you get to, you went from Letterman to the Tonight Show. And I mean, this is amazing. I, I'm yeah. so happy for you, Joe. Thank I can't, you. I just found this out tonight that this is was happening before the camera started rolling. I'm so fucking happy for you, Joe. Congratulations, okay. man. Okay, but really the, the language isn't necessary. But thank I you. know, I know. I get ahead of myself sometimes. There, there are children watching. <laughs> 
Um, let's finish off. I, I'm going to ask you this. If there's one or two people that, uh, you know, Dave is doing the Tom Snyder thing right now, you've got a, a an excellent point of view uh, that is specific and, 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 and inside. If there were a couple of people you'd like to see Dave do the Tom Snyder thing with, uh, who would they be? Um, yeah, I, you know, it won't, I don't know if it would ever happen probably, but I'd really love to see him talk to some of his longtime writers. Like if, if it's Dave, just talking to Mulligan and to yeah. Steve Young and, you know, Steve O'Donnell or God bless her, Meryl Marco, who was responsible oh. for everything. She created everything that made the show. She's the mother of late night. Or, or created everything that, that, that allowed everything else to follow it. So yeah. um, I, I would, I would love to see that. Uh, I don't yeah. know if a lot of other people would, but just as someone who's been there, um, uh, Take my money. People, I'm in. It's like people who'd be more recognizable. Uh, it, it, it would be fun to see uh, uh, like a roundtable of, of, of Dave, Johnny, Conan, and Jay. Let's just, just yeah. okay. Let's talk about what's happened here. Yeah. <laughs> like you know, just just really get everything out in the open. But uh, yeah, Those I I, I I feel the same way. Um, this has been such a thrill for me. We're going to, we're going to call it now. Um, I can't wait till the next time. Um, and, and thank you so, so, so much for this, Joe. And again, my compliments on the background. I, I said it off camera. Uh, if I could come up with the perfect Joe Grossman background, you have it, oh. sir. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. The plane. Great. That is an actual wall there. So, you know, just say, so you know, it's not CGI. <laughs> no. Um, yeah. Thank you, man. Um, do you have anything else that you want to say about your time uh, on on the Letterman podcast here? What were anything else that you want to say before we uh, before we get going? Uh, no, no, I, I think we've covered a lot of stuff. But yeah, again, if you ever want to talk again, I'm I'm totally happy to. There's, you know, there it's, it was a great run, eleven years, and and I, I it, it's fun to, you know, talking to someone else helps me remember things that I didn't know I remembered. So yeah. so I appreciate your questions that uh, bring back memories that that might not have otherwise have resurfaced so uh Outstanding. yeah and I, I hope and they're I all good really... and not ones that you're gonna have to uh to purge and and god damn it i waited seven years to try and get that out of my head now it's back i hope that none of it none of it i hope it's all positive no they're they're, um, they're 70 percent positive and 30 percent horrible hey i'll take uh, which it. is which is a good solid c minus i respect I was just... that <laughs> um but also no, i i appreciate you taking the time to talk to you know not just me but um and other staffers and other people associated with the show but especially the writers just because yeah. um i mean i, I love hearing you know, Steve Young talk or Tom Luprecht or Mulligan, but also the people who I never met. Like I, I've never met Steve O'Donnell. I've never met, I mean, I heard your interview with uh, Dave Rogalski a few days ago and yeah. it's like, wow, that's a guy who I, I know very little about. I've seen his name, the credits. And it was just a, a fascinating talk with someone who I just know nothing about. Yeah. Um, so I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to get, get all these stories. Uh, I appreciate that very much. We've got a lot of very cool creative ideas about moving forward. Uh, I, I want to get a couple of you, uh, you kind of alluded to it a little bit. I want to get a couple of you together, writers who work together or people who work together and and do a little bit of uh, 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 reuniting and and just yeah. seeing the conversation that, that comes from there as well. And then the idea of having, you know, an O'Donnell and a Joe or a, a Fred Graver and a, and a Tommy Ruprecht together or something like that. I, I really love the idea of that. So we've got a lot of cool things planned. Uh, thank you very much for, for, for sure. saying that I'll do uh, I'll do a quick outro and then we can say our goodbye if that's all right with you. Okay. Um, that's another episode of the Letterman podcast, ladies and gentlemen. This is why we do this show. Uh, thank you very, very much for supporting the way that you have already. We've put zero, zero into the show other than organic growth. And this is what we've had so far. It's coming. Uh, Rupert and May at the Hello Deli. Thank you very much. You're our only sponsor. Uh, we're going to try and make this thing official if we can with pants. And so we're not going to take on any other sponsors, but you two will always have. Thank you very much. Go to hello-deli.com for your only source of officially uh merchandised late show with david letterman uh stuff also rupert stuff also if you're in the area please go to the hello deli they make a hell of a sandwich and soup and 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 really good company um again i believe rupert might be one of the most uh, photographed people on a daily basis in new york uh this has been another episode of the letterman podcast with mike chisholm coincidentally i am mike chisholm uh that guy is joe grossman thank you and good night